So, welcome to the Indian Ocean, circa 1750. This is a map held by the Library of Congress. It's actually a contemporary period map from France. We're gonna be we're gonna be pointing at some stuff. So, obviously, there has been piracy in the Indian Ocean, like there has been piracy just about bloody everywhere since time immemorial. As long as, since there have been people on boats, there have been people doing robberies on boats. Well, go ahead. I'd observe Nouveau Zealand is also called Antarctica. But, um, uh, Terra Antarctique. Close enough. Yeah. So, yeah. Here's, here's gonna be an interesting thing. Um, the big thing, though, uh, in the Indian Ocean, uh, prior to the 17th century, is that while piracy exists, there are people robbing each other on the seas. Everything is really, really focused along the coastlines. Right? The coastline of Zanzibar, the coastlines of the uh, Gulf of Arabia, the, the coastlines of the Gulf of Bengal, and the Straits of Malacca um, into Southeast Asia, and of course up all the way to Japan along the uh, South and East China Seas. This all, uh, academics uh, by and large go like, okay, piracy exists, but there is a sea change, um, pun intended, uh, in the late 15th century, with the Portuguese encroachment around the Cape of Good Hope into the Indian Ocean. And that change is state power. Because in periods before this, if you go to sea, that's on you. No one governs the seas, no one claims to govern the seas. And, uh... So if you were to say be a Baghdadi merchant, and you go down, and you hop into the Persian Gulf, and you start making a trip around, and your name is Sinbad, and you get stuck in the Maldives for a while, uh, that's on you, right? No one's governing that. The Khalif is not going to go bail you out, but the Khalif is probably not funding your expedition. It's, it's just entirely a private venture. And being a private venture, um, most of the uh, piracy is very crisis-oriented, you know, someone has a bad harvest, they need to rob some stuff to make up the difference. Uh, and it's very personally negotiated, and it's very low-level. There's not mass piracy, there's mostly just, uh, just, there's a risk that someone's going to show up and demand some of your cargo. You might hire some archers or some gunmen to help protect your boat, you might not, it's on you. The change the Portuguese government makes, uh, and the uh, after them the East India companies for the Dutch, the English, and the French, is they start issuing cards. And the cards that they are doing, uh, issue, say, you are a licensed merchant vessel with the Portuguese government, the Portuguese gov- uh, Portuguese warships are not going to attack you, uh, you have been approved, you, uh, and if you are not carrying this, you risk, uh, all of your goods being subject to search and seizure. These are ludicrously expensive. Like, these, these carts, these, uh, effectively letters of market, merchant, uh, authority are unbelievably expensive, and they, uh, seriously, it's basically, you know, Organized highway robbery and extortion, uh, and people along the coasts recognized it as such. Uh, when the so they have a lot of difficulty. Their difficulty comes to them in a couple of different places. First one is uh, in northwestern uh, India with the uh, Mughal emperors, right uh, in India right now. Uh, there is a Muslim Mughal um, ruler based in the Gujarat province, up here. And um, projecting power fairly far across the Indian subcontinent. They're not a big fan of this. 
Um, unfortunately, they're kind of in a period of some decline. Aurangzeb is the last great Mughal emperor, uh, dies in 1707. So they're in a period of some decline and stress here, so they end up having to negotiate with the Portuguese colonies pretty heavily. Um, but they're not a fan of this, and so they are a resort to smuggling. And in the southwest and southeast, just generally right southern coastal India, uh, in the Malagasy area, uh, there are a whole bunch of fortified cities that say, no thank you. Just, no thank you, we do not like your warrants of trade, we are not interested in this. And they end up driving a lot of the Portuguese colonies out. At the same time, over here, in, near the Strait of Hormuz, is uh, the uh, Yarubi Omani Kingdom. Uh, they drive the Portuguese out here, and they set up their own uh, principality here, uh, and it rapidly does piracy, and is a thorn in everyone's side into the mid-1700s. Uh, the late six... Uh, sorry, the late... Uh, yeah. The late 1600s, Words are hard. The... Right. In the late 1600s, uh, the Dutch and the English uh, obviously come come in. Uh, they've been presents beforehand, but around 1650, a little bit after that, they become the dominant companies. And so you have the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company. Uh, you know, the bad guys in every movie ever. What? Getting there. Libertalia's 1690s. Don't don't get ahead of the story, Peter. The thing is, right, the Dutch and the English try and do the same thing, but now that you have three different states running around here, right? You have three different um corporations that are the uh you have three different corporations that are projections of state and pseudo-state power from up here. Out here. Which means someone on the coastline here, from Surat perhaps, now has to buy a Dutch pass. Has to buy an English pass. And has to buy a Portuguese pass. And even if you do that, you still might get robbed by one of the other ones. So it sucks if you are a merchant who made their life tra trading cinnamon and cardamom uh, from Ceylon or Sri Lanka to Surat, your life sucks right now. No one's having a good time. And so, if you guess what happens if you don't buy a pass? You're now branded a smuggler and barred from, uh, arrested, your goods are seized, um, you're extorted, and you're barred from being able to get a pass again. And now you are stuck on the periphery of maritime society. What are your options? Go do piracy about it! Right, so in many ways, the piracy as a phenomenon in the Indian Ocean, uh, as a social phenomenon in any large-scale revolt effort, is a result of European colonialism. How dare they, I, right? It's terrible news. It sucks. No, they're not having a good time. Yar har ho. Um, at the same time, though, Right, so we've got pirates up here. Mal um, European sources are remarkably bad at distinguishing various Malagasy peoples uh, and cities that are not always agreeing with each other. That's a monolith of people we don't like, are called Malagasy, uh, but they're, they're from largely like here and then uh, even some ways all the way up to Col uh, Kolkata. Up here, there are little enclaves of piracy. And, you know, in the uh, islands here, in the Maldives and the Lakhdives, uh, there's plenty of little inlets and stuff that pirates can hide in, so it's a good place to go do some raiding. You've got pirates coming out of Oman, uh, doing raiding all across here, including interrupting people on the Hajj, right? A Mughal ship could go... ...and land at Jeddah before going to Mecca. Eighteenth-century French spelling, right there. Um, late 
about 1670, the French are getting involved. They're a bit late onto the scene and are never as prominent. But they they primarily set up kind of here, here, uh, right, Réunion, Madagascar, Mozambique. So they they actually end up largely setting up shop more in this area, a little bit less in this area. Anyway, you know who else gets sets up shop in this area? Europeans and Americans. Enter two of the most famous pirates of the entire golden age of piracy. Henry Avery and William Kidd. And uh, special shout out to Thomas too. He's going to come back in like 20 minutes. Not even. 10 minutes? 10 minutes. So... In the 1690s, uh, as the environment on the other side of the Atlantic, somewhere somewhere off that direction, uh, is getting increasingly increasingly unfriendly to pirates, uh, as the governorships of Jamaica are getting uh, established, uh, as fewer opportunities for privateering are emerging in the 1690s, as uh, buccaneers are becoming wildly anti-pirate see Woods Rogers a little bit later. Um, uh, folks, look to the... And as, you know, the silver trade from the Atlantic and the slave trade, uh, the transatlantic slave trade is stable but not growing, people look over here and they see the spice ships. Cinnamon, cardamom, black pepper, nutmeg from the Banda Islands out here, uh, and there's, they realize that there's a lot of money to be had in this area. And folks coming to and from Hajj with offerings of gold and silver. Right, you have Chinese porcelains, right? You have Chinese porcelains making their way over by maritime routes. You have spices from India and uh, the Indonesia. You've got people on Hajj from Gujarat uh, ending, bringing gold and silver and uh, rich textiles across here. You've got trade from Great uh, Zimbabwe coming up here. You've got flow of human beings in slave trades uh, all through this area. And so a bunch of American and European pirates set up shop on the inlets of northern Madagascar and the Comoro Islands. More like, okay, Zimbabwe, well, your taste may vary. It's pretty cool. Uh, they raid, right, all across here. Uh, they particularly are active. Henry Avery is particularly active in the Red Sea. Um, stealing, like, blowing up ships on Hajj. Uh, but at one point, uh, actually kidnaps um, out of the Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb's flagship. <laughs> Henry Avery gave no... Did not care. Um, William Kidd also... Actually, I think it was William Kidd did that. I, get, I got my pirates confused. William Kidd uh, kidnapped Aurangzeb's flagship. Henry Avery um, kept his head a little bit lower and did that. Now, William Kidd, active uh, 1695 to 1697, give or take, in this area, is so notorious that the general pardon for pirates excludes him by name. It specifically says anyone who gives themselves up to the crown will be a uh, pardoned for piracy unless if your name is William Kidd. You in particular can go to hell. So he gets uh, he heads back to America in 1698, um, disbelieving that he was excluded from the thing and just trusting he'd be fine. He gets arrested in Boston and hanged. Uh, Henry Avery? just disappears a few years later. Unsure what happened to him. Uh, if you believe Uncharted 4, he set up shop somewhere in this area and was like, it's fine. Libertalia, ho. Huh? And Henry, one of Henry Avery's companions, uh, Thomas Tew, who I said would come back, only took five minutes, uh, also said, raise it in here, he gets killed in the Red Sea. But, notice all these folks have super short careers, right? Being a pirate is not a way to live long. It is a way to get very wealthy and then die. But it's not a way to live long. 
Thomas too has uh, an interesting consequence in that uh, he, while he set up shop in northern Madagascar, he has a son? And his son becomes the first ruler of Betsimis Haraka. A, a Madagascan, uh, Malagasy, uh, enclave state th that lasts until the mid 1800s. Or actually, okay, early 1800s. So, King collapsed in 1791, uh, and then expands into the marina and then gets ruled by French colonialism later. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, Betsimis Soraka is founded by the son, supposedly, the son of Thomas II. So the pirate legacy um, kind of continues, and they continue to be active um, on sort of low-level maritime trade for a good long while. So much for them. As we look at this again, uh, the last place of note is over here. Because obviously there have been significant pirates operating since Ming, the Ming Dynasty, uh, in around here. We are too early for Zheng Di Sao, uh, or Cheng Shi. She is active in the 19th century. She is wildly later than everyone else. Pirates of the Caribbean lies to you. Um, shocking, I know. But, uh, she ends up being very active all throughout this area with an enormous fleet later on. There are, however, uh, pirates from the coast of China and Japan that end up raiding all the way down in here as well. Basically, uh, the entire century is completely rife with pirates uh, forming that are from several distinct groups that individually have different motivations for starting piracy, different uh, ways of enacting piracy, and different ships that they use to do so. The folks here on the sort of the southern coast of India are particularly interesting because their ships are scary. They are fast, open decked, latin sailed um, galleys that can fit a hundred gunmen on them uh, and like one or two artillery pieces. So they are nowhere near as strong individually as a British warship, but they are pretty darn strong. That being said, um, the, it is worth spending a little bit more time talking about the ships. So, uh, the actual example given here from the Malabaris. Right. The Malabari ones, uh... Oh, it is Henry Avery did capture it. I had it right the first time. Chat, don't listen to me. Henry Avery did capture, uh, Aurangzeb's ship. Don't worry about it. I'm good at this. Uh, this is what you get when you give me 24 hours of notice. Anyway, does it actually... Where's the description of the ships? Does it say it? I thought it was this source that did. Heck, there it is, yeah. Um, so, two ships now, Sambuks and Almadias. Sailed the length of the west coast of India, escorted by Malabar Paraos. Those were fast, small galleries of approximately 60 tons, manned by 20 to 30 oarsmen. They could carry three or four pieces of artillery and a hundred archers or arquebusiers. They were open decked and latin rigged, which means they have a triangular sail, with one or two masts. Malabar sailors were also intrepid seamen who could outmaneuver big vessels, with a common mode of attack of throwing fire pots uh, onto decks of the enemy ships. So those exist in contrast to a ship known as the Indiaman. Um, let's see, 17th century ship. We'll see if this pulls up correctly. It sure did. Well, that almost worked. This is a 19th century one, but it still is instructive. These things are fucking bulky. Go in. Thank you for the three gifted subs. Uh, Displays Lightride, Fiesi1234, and Randy Carter. Enjoy your bonus emotes. 
Also, my name is you. Congratulations. Uh, finishing finals. Okay. Everyone else who is finishing um, their semesters, congratulations to you too. Glad you're uh, hanging out with us to do more history. We're trying. Anyway, these things are fucking bulky. These can these are over a thousand tons uh, at their largest. So they are some of the largest ships in the time period. They can hold like 50 to 60 cannon. They're, uh, they are the largest shipping vessels in th that Europe had ever constructed. Uh, technically, Chinese junks are bigger, but they're, these are pretty damn close. These become the gold standard um, for merchant war vessels. This also causes a lot of stress in European circles, uh, where it's like, wait, this is a military ship that is also a merchant ship. That's weird, right? Right? We're concerned about this, right? Right, guys? Right? Don't worry about it. The, the East India Company is definitely the good guys. 100%. They're so big. And yeah, they uh, are an expression of power, right? Uh, the way you deal... Since these letters of um, allowance didn't work very well, since these things had to go up against stone castles along the Malabar coast, um, and since uh, the uh, inroads, the Dutch or the East India Company's inroads into inland India doesn't exist yet, they are operating exclusively in maritime um, and in port cities. They have not like exerted de facto colonial control over much of India yet. Give it time. Uh, so they are entirely reliant on the East India Man uh, ship. And these Man of Wars are freaking enormous. And that sort of sets up the space of what the game's gonna be, right? So we have hefty, hefty European vessels um, moving in convoys along the high seas. Uh, Operating against more often pirate vessels that are much smaller, much lighter tonnage, much faster, and operating in coastal waters exclusively. So, there's a really fascinating technological tension here where neither one is better, right? Neither one is better for any purpose. The pirates were perfectly successful, but we have this uh, technological difference that could at various times be operated on. And, you know, uh, smaller vessels, right, um, regular frigates and schooners coming from the Caribbean uh, from European and American pirates. So, right, we've got several different types of ships navigating these waters, and that actually offer, offers some really fun things for Skull and Bones to do if they're leaning into this naval combat. So there's what you need to know, right? Honestly, that's, that is all that we super must know before going into this in order to, I think, have a good time uh, and be able to start taking a look at what the history does. That being said, obviously, if there are things that you want us to talk about, look into, or learn about together while we are going, keep an eye on that channel points menu for especially that research time redemption. Uh, feel free to redeem those uh, while we're going. I've got nowhere else to be, so let's hang out, um, do, learn some history together. There's plenty of things to dive into, but this game is not going to play itself, so... Uh, hope you enjoyed my rambling. Hope you enjoyed my not a PowerPoint PowerPoint. And uh, let's see what's going on.